Can everybody hear me? <laughs> we should have got a taller <laughs> little thing here, but uh, I, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I said this morning it's, it's a great blessing uh, for me uh, to be able to tell you at least some of what God's done for me, and I'm sure that I'll get a lot more out of this than y'all will, but uh, I, I would usually open up by praying, but I don't think there's anything I could add to what Gray just asked the Lord to do for us, uh, and that's to make us aware of just how well cared for we are by Him. Uh, so I, I really do I want to thank all of you for being here. I know you've all prayed for me. I, 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 the first few times I came to church, even little Hope Kilpatrick would come up to me and say, I, I prayed for you. And I don't know how, I can't tell you how moving that is and how much it's meant to me, knowing uh, that so many people have prayed for me so much and so many times. Uh, but I, I want to uh, start by telling you a, a familiar story, at least for most of you, and that's the story of, uh, of uh, Joseph. And if you remember his uh, brothers, he had 11 older brothers, and they hated him. And they threw him in the well and uh, intended to kill him, but his oldest brother Reuben talked him out of it. But they sold him into slavery. And he ended up going to Egypt, where he became the second most powerful person in the strongest country in the, uh, in the world at that time. And if you all remember, many, many years later, uh, there was a famine, and his family, including his father and all his brothers, came to him, and uh, they needed food. And eventually, they found out that uh, Joseph was their younger brother, and they came before him, and expecting that he would have, have be vengeful, and horrible things would happen to him. And if you remember what Joseph told them was that what you meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. And he forgave his brothers and he saved all of uh, the Israel. And uh, it was amazing how God had used that evil event. And in my situation, I see so many parallels where it is such a cold, cruel, hard world. It is filled with evil and everything is meant to harm us and hurt us. And God protects us, even though we're lulled in by the comfort that we live in and by as many, many blessings. And I think we believe that the world is good and that it's safe. And we don't realize that it's God's mighty arm that uh, in his Holy Spirit and armies of angels around us that are turning that evil uh, into good over and over and over again. And it happens every moment and it's God's ordinary grace to us. But when we do see it, uh, we often say, that's a miracle. And the reality is, when I look at my situation, it, he was preparing for this, not just years, but years, but eons ago. <laughs> and so I want to tell you some more of that, but I have to warn my family that if I look up and see y'all start crying, and you make me start crying, I'm going to point to you and everybody's going to laugh at you. So you, you better not. <laughs> But in 1998, Janie and I went to Russia to adopt our now 20-year-old son, Reed. And it is probably, I could call it the best thing that we've ever done. But somewhere in there, as a result of that trip, I contracted hepatitis B. And um, most adults that contract this uh, never even know it. Their body fights it off, they immunize themselves to it, and uh, never even have any symptoms at all. And truthfully, many of you may be that exact uh, situation. But one out of 10 uh, don't do that. Their body contracts the disease, and they don't become immune to it, and it becomes what the doctors call chronic hepatitis B, and that's me. Um, so, I had very few symptoms, and I lived a, just a perfectly normal life for 19 years. <laughs> but it, and at least two times in going to the doctors, they told me that at the age when I contracted that, 43, that most likely something else would get me before that would. 
and there was no medicine to take at the time. Uh, of course, no cure, uh, it, nothing effective to even really slow it down. So now they do have a, a couple of things, just within the last couple of years, that'll slow it down but not cure it. So last September, I began to feel kind of bad. And I, I knew that what it was, but I also knew there wasn't much that we could do about it, that uh, there was no medicine. And uh, I hid it as best I could because I didn't want Janie and the kids to worry. And uh, I thought, well, this will go on for a long time. I'll have bad days and good days, but, you know, we'll just fight through it. But it got to the point where you can't hide from your wife that you slept 14 hours every day during the week. You, you know, there's just so much that you can hide. And so on the first Sunday of November, uh, I was in the emergency room. She had told me that you, you got to go do something. You can't just sit here. And we went out there and they told me that I had serious liver trouble, which was no big surprise. But they said, well, you need to see a, a specialist. And I got an appointment at the internist. And I'm gonna tell you, you know when you are in serious trouble, when your doctor sits down and looks at you and tells you what's wrong with you, and he has tears in his eyes. And that's what happened that uh, Tuesday when we saw the interns. He said, the only possibility here is for you to have a liver transplant, and we need to get this process started. And he set me up for an appointment on December the 6th with the Jackson uh, Medical Center and the liver transplant team. And in the meantime, I went to the emergency room out here, this was over a two week period, two more times. Um, and I learned one thing, that there's a secret to emergency rooms. You, you know, you go in there and there's lots of people and little kids running around and you don't feel good and you really don't want to wait. You know, you, you want things to happen. So if you go in and you walk up to the desk and you start yelling, barf bag, barf bag, barf bag, and throw up right there in front of them, they take you right on to the back and you get a nurse and a doctor and, and everything happens really, really fast. Uh, so uh, two trips to the emergency room and on my last trip, it was a Sunday, they, we went in in the morning and that afternoon they sent me home and said, there's really nothing we can do. Uh, and I will tell you that I, I was really, really in bad physical shape. Uh, so on the t following Tuesday, two days later, Meryl and Janie uh, loaded me up and took me down to Jackson for my initial uh, visit with the transplant team. And you go into this mall and it's a, and that's what it is, it's a huge mall, just like walking in the biggest one you can imagine. But it's full of doctor's offices and labs and all kind of things. And they took me in, rolled me in this room, they had me in a, little, in a wheelchair, and the room was about the size of Diane's office or smaller. And there was about 10 people in there and they got me on the examining table and the doctor came in. We call him Dr. A because I can't say his name. He's from Ghana. He's a wonderful man. And he took one look at me and he said, this man belongs in the hospital. Take him over there right now. And I said, good, because I don't feel too good. At least that's what Merrill tells me I said, because I really don't remember much of that visit. And I don't really remember too much of the next three weeks. Uh, things were really really jumbled up in my mind I, chronologically. But there's a lot I do remember. <laughs> so the first week of December from Tuesday to a Friday, they ran these tests that normally take six months and they got them all done over three weeks time. And all that while I was pretty much laying in ICU connected to tubes and machines that were keeping me alive. And on Friday they gave me a score that's called a, a mailed test and the score for that male test and the highest you can get is a 40 and the surgeon told Janie that my actual score was a 53 and that I was the sickest man he had ever worked on. Uh, that doctor by the way is the great grandson of, Do of President Harry Truman uh, and uh, so they had done all this to get me ready and as I mentioned early they, they got me on the list, and, um, but it, it really, truly is a cold, hard, cruel world because the doctors looked, called Janie and, and said, 
okay, here's the situation. Uh, we've got to have money. If there's no payment, he doesn't get a liver. Uh, if there's no money, he dies, is what they were telling her. And I know what your mind is probably thinking, but that doctor or the hospital, the people, they are probably the bigger victims in this than any, anybody. Can you imagine how cruel it is to a person who's devoted their life to taking care of others and the compassion that's in them to have to tell someone that if they can't afford it, they die? But that situation happens over and over and over and over and over, not just in our country, but the world over. Um, but what the world means for evil, God uses for good. And our family is not a, a wealth, particularly wealthy family. I'd put us probably in the middle of all of y'all, but we're blessed. There's no question about it. And two years ago, Janie and I had made a decision for her to sell some land, some family land that uh, she had inherited. And we had sold it, and the money was in the bank, and we couldn't decide what to do with it for 18 months. We had, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? But we never had done anything. And so when the doctor told her they needed money, she said, well, I have some, I sold some land, and I can write a check. And he looked at her and he said, I don't think you know how much money I'm talking about. And you really have to know my wife to appreciate this. But she looked at him and she said, I don't think you know how much land I sold. <laughs> now, and he told her and she wrote him a check. And that money, as I've reflected on it, was passed down from generation to generation. Her family had owned that land for 200 years. And... How many times had the opportunity come for someone to sell it in those 200 years? How many cows had they raised and sold to pay for it? And timber had they sold to pay the taxes? And the amazing part is she sold it to a cousin and a, and a beloved uncle. The land is still in the family. We still go down there and enjoy it just like we still owned it. it, it really, the purpose was for me to <laughs> get a liver. And we look at that and say, that's a miracle. But that's God's ordinary grace. He planned that from the time he made the land. <laughs> um, and we didn't have a clue that he was doing so. So uh, when they put me on that list, I have to tell you that the average waiting time is 285 days. And there was already 17,000 people on the list. That's how many are waiting to get a liver. And I was number one, with the, went straight to the top. It's the only time I've ever been number one in anything. <laughs> but, and so at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, they started the surgery that lasted nine hours. And that night they closed me, they didn't close me up. Janie says they wrapped me in saran wrap and finished the next day. Um, and when I began to come to after the surgery, I can tell you that I was suffering. And I don't mean pain-wise. I, I don't remember much pain. I, I'm sure there were, but it, it, it was tough. I, I was on a ventilator. Uh, that's a tube for you, the younger ones that may not know that helps you breathe. I had these heavy blood pressure boots on my feet, and then I couldn't even move my feet. I couldn't lift, lift them up. I had a catheter in my shoulder that ran into my heart and it was connected to a dialysis machine because my kidneys had failed. And it beeped and whirred and made noise 24 hours a day. It was right beside my head. I had a catheter in my side that drained fluid out about a gallon a day or so and it leaked. It, so the bed stayed wet all day long and I stayed soaked most of the day. And I had another catheter that that hurt, but we're not going to talk about that one. Um, and I had an IV in my arm, and they had my legs and my wrists tied to the bed so that I couldn't pull anything out. Also, so that I couldn't scratch my nose or rub my face or do anything. Um, and I had a feeding tube that went in this nostril and ran down into my stomach. And every day the nurse would come in, and she would 
open up this little bag of stuff and she would mix some warm water in there and pour my medicine in there and stir it up and take this little tiny funnel and pour it in there and that was breakfast, lunch, and supper. And there's no taste, there's no swallowing, but the day that it came time to take that out, I, I, I have to tell you, nurses communicate in sort of a special way and I, I began to learn this. I hadn't quite learned it that day. They don't really want to hurt you. And so they will kind of tell you a few things and sometimes they'll just flat out lie to you. But if they say, it's going to be a little stick or this might hurt, what that means is you better grit your teeth and hold on because they're fixing to hurt you really, really bad. And the worst possible thing that you can hear is when if they say, Mr. Williams, you're not going to like this, but in whatever comes next, you are not going to like it. So the day came finally down the road to take out this feeding tube, and I was worried. I was thinking, you know, is it going to hurt? Maybe it's hung on something down there, and they're going to really mess up when they pull it out, or maybe it's just glued somewhere or something. And uh, I, 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 like I say, I was worried. And she said, it won't hurt at all. And she reached up and she pulled a hole up, undid the Dolphin tape and popped it out. And I didn't feel a thing, nothing. And I was as relieved as I could be. And then she said, Mr. Williams, you're not going to like this, but I forgot to give you your lunch and I've already put the medicine in there. And she had this little vial of stuff and she said, why don't you just drink it? And I hadn't had anything to eat for like four weeks. <laughs> and she mixed it up and it had my medicine in it and I drank it and it was the worst tasting stuff I have ever put in my mouth. All I can tell you is it, it did not taste like chicken. But it, 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 the suffering, all the tubes and all that, I, I know there are ways that people can suffer more, but I, just, I don't see how. So... I had mentioned this morning, um, I, I know everybody prayed for me. And believe me, in that, the whole period, but in, especially in those three or four weeks, it felt like I had a long, continual prayer with God. And at first I began to pray, Lord God, why? Why? Why am I going through this? You, What did I do to deserve this? I, I've tried to be faithful, and I'm not dependent on what I've done. I'm a sinner, and Jesus has forgiven me. And I know I've failed you in every possible way, but you promised not to hold that against me. This was my prayer. I know I'm weak in my faith, but you're strong. Why? Why am I laying here suffering like this? And I got no answer. And so then my prayer shifted a little bit because I remembered... King Nebuchadnezzar and how low he had been and I said Lord how low am I going to go is it going to get worse I mean I'm on a ventilator and a feeding tube and I got holes all in me and I can't move my hands or feet and I can barely move my head and I'm wearing a diaper I'm a grown man and, I, and, and it needs changing I'm covered in my own filth Lord God how low am I going to get well, I'll be hooked to these machines for years, and what's my life going to be like? And I got absolutely no answer. Um, and the truth is that I was scared. And I wasn't scared of dying. I was scared of living. Uh, for the 10 days after my surgery, 10 or 11, I, I, I didn't sleep virtually any. And... There was this big male nurse, and I, I, Big John is what I called him. I'm not sure if that's his name or not. But he came in my room and over and over and over. And my room was a, it was intensive care, and it was zipped up, and you had to put on this, they had to put on this special suit and wear masks and things before they'd come in. But he would come in and he would say, you're okay. You're in the hospital. There's nobody that's going to hurt you. You've got to sleep. You got a new liver and your body needs rest. You've got to sleep. But I couldn't. It just, I would fall asleep and a moment later wake back up. Jamie, Janie came in one morning. And I didn't know this until a few days ago when she told me. And there was a doctor there at my bedside and he was holding me. 
and he told her that he'd been there all night and that I had been scared and restless and him holding me seemed to calm me down. And he sat there for hours holding on to me. And I tell you that because God works in amazing ways. Nobody knew that man was there except him and me. And I didn't know it. I, I didn't even remember it. And yet that act of kindness, it, it, he didn't have to do that. But it, that whole situation, God was using it for good. And I pray that it was a comfort to him to do that, that he got a lot of good out of it. I believe that he did. And certainly Janie did. But it was because it was such an encouragement to see that how deeply people cared. But in my world there, laying there, unaware of so much of this other, it, even though I could hear conversations here and there, I was still praying, and I was praying hard, and I told everybody this this morning at church, but I got to the point where I said, Lord God Almighty, I'm coming to you in Jesus' name with all the power that he, He's given on the cross, all the authority that He said, I ask in my name and shall be given to you. I'm coming to you, Lord, because He was whipped and beaten, and spit on and nailed to the cross. He sacrificed His own life so that I can stand here before the throne of God Almighty and all the angels in heaven and ask you what I'm going to ask you now. And I have never prayed a prayer that I meant any more than that one. And I said, Lord God, you made promises to me. And I began to quote Scripture to Him. And I said, you, you said, Lord, that my burden is light and my yoke is easy coming to me. You said, Lord, knock and the door will be opened and I'm knocking. You said, seek and you shall find. You said, Lord, you said, you said over and over and I recounted all the promises of God that I could think of. And I said, Lord God, now keep your promise and give me what I want. And I want to die now. And it was like I was talking to a wall. I got no answer at all. And I told somebody weeks ago that I came up with a plan, but that's not quite right. What I did was I refused to live. I, I, I lay there in that bed and somewhere made the conscious decision that I was, would not live. And so on Christmas Eve... 13 days after my surgery, when most liver transplant patients would have gone home, um, the hospital called Janie and said, you need to come to the hospital now. And she said, why, what's wrong? And they said, he's unresponsive. Uh, and she said, you mean he's in a coma? And they said, well, not exactly a coma, but he won't respond to anything. And so my family, gathered on Christmas Eve, and they spent all that night and Christmas Day and the next four or five days wondering if I was going to wake up. And I laid there a total of five days, and Merrill calls it the Christmas we all took turns yelling, Dad, wake up! Dad, wake up! Dad, wake up! And again, what the world means for evil God uses for good because I can tell you that uh, my family is stronger now in their faith than they've ever been. Uh, every single one of us. And I can tell you that we're stronger in our love for each other than I think we've ever been and in our respect for each other in every way. And I believe that my friends are the same way, that their faith is stronger uh, because of what I went through. And that God had a purpose for me suffering that way. And it was a good purpose. And what Satan loved, the evil part of it, God uses it for good. And I'm convinced that the answer to my first prayer, why, 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 is in some, one, some small part so I could stand up here today and tell you all this. Um, so my plan, or lack of one, to to lay there and refuse to live, uh, the doctors would say that it was a reaction to some of the drugs they had given me, they thought, but they didn't really know. And I, I'm not going to tell you that for five days I laid there and pretended or to, and to uh, be out and to ignore people, but there were certainly times like that. I remember at least two occasions when they came in to, and tried to wake me up. 
and the doctor took pins and he began to stick them on my legs, up and down my legs and, uh, and my feet. No problem. I could ignore that all day long. And then he took his light, the one that shines in your eyes to see if your pupils are dilated. And he opened my eyes and he shined it in there and it was like a laser beam. And I just looked straight into it and didn't move consciously, willing myself. And I thought, if he blinds me, that's okay, because I'm going to die. I don't need to see anymore. I'll just stare and I won't move. And then he got serious. He went around to the end of the bed, and bear in mind there were five or six other nurse uh, uh, doctors to be in there. It was a teaching hospital. And he got my big toes, both of them, and he pinched them as hard as he could pinch them. And it hurt, but I ignored it. I, I, did, I didn't move a muscle. And I, they left, and I thought, I can do this. I, I can ignore them. Well, then they sent in this expert. This was some time later. And he started with the pins on my legs, and I thought, I got this. No problem. We'll do it again. And then he put that light in my eyes and shined it in there, and I was thinking, He's no different than the rest of them. But his life was different some way. I, I don't know what it was, but he had a strobe on it, and it was off on, off on, off on, and it was, it was as irritating as it could be. And all my effort, I ignored it. I, I, I didn't move. And then he, I don't know what it was, but he had something that was like a, he was beating on my head inside. It was like a drum, and it was in the same timing as the light. And it was a thumping, and, a, and it was off, on, off, on, off, on. And I, I ignored it somehow. So then he got moved to the big toes. And bear in mind, I hadn't even flinched. And he took both my big toes, just like the other, and he pinched them as hard as he could pinch them. And then he twisted them backwards the wrong way. Now, there's a reason why these surgeons and doctors graduate from places like Vanderbilt in these medical degrees. He was sharp because while he was doing all that pinching, he was watching my eyes. And when he twisted those toes the wrong way, I flinched. And he saw it. He didn't miss it. He, said, he moved. He flinched. And all the rest of them, I didn't see it. So he did it again. And I flinched again. And I knew that I couldn't pretend any longer. I knew that I couldn't just refuse to live. And as I thought about that, I, I gave up. And I prayed, God, I'm totally helpless. You are all I've got. Would you please, please just be my God. Just show up. That's all I wanted. And he did. That's when he answered me. And it was clear as a bell ringing. And I'm not going to tell you that I heard words or that I saw visions or I had some out-of-body experience or that I died and went to heaven and came back. It, it was not like that. But he imparted information to me. <laughs> and for lack of a better word or description, he spoke to me. And when I said, God... Please just be my God. He said, you don't deserve me. And I thought about that for a moment. And he said, but I love you anyway. And he didn't have to say anything more because he made me feel it. And I can tell you that I love you. And I can say things that arouse feelings in you or do things that uh, show you how I love you, but I cannot make you feel what I'm feeling for you. And God made me feel what He felt for me. And He didn't have to say anything else because I, from that point on, I trusted Him. And it, 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 it didn't matter what happened after that. Um, it didn't matter if I lived or if I died or if I was in the hospital for years. Whatever was going to happen to me was going to be okay. When my youngest daughter, Callie, uh, was little, my nickname for her was Taterbug. And uh, that's what I call her. And she was standing there beside me and 
she was yelling, Dad, you got to wake up. You need to wake up. You're doing good. Wake up. And I knew I couldn't pretend any longer, and I said, well, okay. And so I think she was holding my hand, and I squeezed her hand, and I opened my eyes, and I said, hey, Taterbug. And she started hollering. <laughs> she said, he's awake. He woke up. And Janie and they all said, hey, well, he's awake. He's awake. And I said, yeah, I'm awake. And, and the steady stream of people started coming, what, what I remember. And from that day on, and today, it's kind of the same way. You know, whatever God has in store for me, it's okay. I might not make it through tonight. I was on dialysis for 90 days after the surgery, and I prayed as hard as I could that I'd get off the dialysis machine, and fortunately I have, but it would have been okay if I hadn't. I'm keenly aware that the liver that I have I'm seven months out, and that's good. I've passed some of the danger periods by number, but it could fail any any moment. Uh, my heart could quit. Uh, who knows? But it's it's okay. That's what he's told me. That's what I've got. And I, I could think of countless scriptures that would echo that sentiment. But one that comes to mind most often to me is in Matthew 13, where Jesus is teaching his disciples. And he tells them, uh, and they tell him, or they start shooing the little children away. The children, little children are running around and they're bothering everybody. And he's, they, they want them to leave. And Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me. And if you remember when you read that, he touches them. He picks them up and I like to think and puts them in his lap and Maybe rubs their hair, but he, he holds them close and he says, unless you have faith like these little children, you won't see, enter the kingdom of God. And I used to think, well, that means I have to be as innocent as I could be and live as good a life as I can. And, and, and I don't believe that's what he had in mind at all. When I look at my little grandbabies, 20 months old, and they look at their mamas and daddies, they don't know what they want or what they need. They think they do. But they know when they go run to mama or daddy that they will love them and take care of them. They don't know what to ask for, but they know who to get, go to get it, and they know it's going to be okay. And that's the picture that, I, that Christ gives us in Matthew 13, and really in every part of the Bible, that he, God knows what's best for us, and He loves us, and we can trust Him. And that means that we can trust Him if we've got walking canes or cancer, or heart trouble, or children that act up, or marriages that are weak, or financial problems, or even if you're lying at death's door with 24 hours like I, I, I did, uh, we can trust Him. Because truly, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, we can fear no evil. Uh, the question that I am most often asked is, do you know the donor? Uh, do, do you know anything about them? And I do not. Um, it's completely anonymous, and I'll never know, and his family won't ever know me. I know, and this just to give you an idea of the odds that I was up against when I had 24 hours to get a liver. I know that they were the same size as me, or maybe slightly larger. I know they had the same tissue types, the same blood type, and other DNA characteristics. I know they died on Saturday night, most likely from a gunshot, car wreck, or a stroke, but not from any disease. I believe he was born, or she, after 1994, since the liver I received was vaccinated against hepatitis B and has been a law since that time. I like to think it was a he, and I've often referred to it, but it very well could have been a woman. And they do encourage us to write a thank you note to the family. And I've written one, and, and I thought about it a lot before that I did it. But what do you say? Um, words just really won't do. I mean, what do you say to someone that's lost a child or a spouse, and you're alive because they died? And this was sort of my best shot. And I tell you because I can't tell them. But 
uh, dear family of the donor, the darkness has fallen away, and I see things now I didn't see before. And I have dreams. I dream about Christmas is to come. I dream about singing how great the art in church. I dream about birthdays and uh, weddings and dancing at, at those weddings. I dream about my children and how proud I are of them on, and the chance to tell them that I love them and say it out loud. And I dream about a world where mamas won't bury their children and fathers won't cry over their sons gone too soon. And I dream and I, my dreams because of their loved one will one day come true. And so I pray that those that donor's family has dreams too. And I pray that there are dreams of peace. And the parallel as Christians, it, it, we just can't ignore. Because what do you say to a father that's willing to give his son so to die so that you can live? And you can tell me, if you can, what words there are to do. I can't find any. But I'm going to try to answer that by the way that I live, by the way that I trust Him, and by the way that I serve, and I hope by the way that I tell others about Him and what He's done for me. Uh, because I, I'm doing well. I'm 50 pounds lighter than I was before, and I'm blessed in so many ways. I can eat anything I want, as much ice cream as I want, as much dessert, all the bad stuff I want. And I've told people a lot that physically, I'm probably a wreck. But mentally and spiritually, I'm in a better place than I've ever been in my life. And that is God's miracle. And so I want to close with asking you the same question. What do you tell God when words, what do you say when words just won't do? So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you tell us that the sparrows of the field uh, do no work and yet you care for them. The lilies toil and they spin and they're so beautiful and cared for and they do nothing for it. And that us, whom you love so much more, uh, how much more we're cared for. And Lord, we don't see it every day. And we don't understand it. And we don't know the depth of the love that goes into protecting us and uh, the plans that you've made for us and how good they are. And uh, Father, we were told in Scripture that surely what the Lord God ordains shall surely come to pass. So Father, I pray that as we see your uh, will done and as these good things come to pass, that we would know that they are from the Lord God Almighty and that you would help us to understand over and over and over until the very day when we die just how much you love us. And so we ask this now in Christ's holy name. Amen.